Hi, everyone, and welcome to this special Uber YouTube only exclusive super episode. Um, how are you, Paul? Oh, I'm awesome. Thanks, David. Yeah, look, I, I haven't hyped that much, but, um, you know, we, we're really pleased to do this little bit of extra content. We are trying to do a few of these, um, and we're going to do a little small, uh, little small series. That's great English. We're going to do a small series of catch-ups with people running different online groups and forums related to all of our favourite topic, keyboard players. And so we're going to kick off tonight with two moderators of a Facebook group that Paul and not. I are also involved with, which is keyboard players in cover bands, if you're on Facebook, and we'll post a link in the show notes. And uh, we've caught up with uh, Ken Matson and Walter Galindo um, from, from that group, and we chat about a whole bunch of stuff. And I think, Paul, that uh, people might enjoy what we get up to. Yeah, and, and it's a bit of a different perspective, this one, because as, as our listeners and viewers know, we're, we're interviewing notable keyboard players who, if you if you follow keyboards, you've, you've heard of probably 90% of our guests, or if not, you've heard of the bands they've been in. Well, in the case of, of Ken and Walter, although they are exceptionally good players with a really interesting history, they're not household names and nor are the bands that they play in, but they, they've got a great connection. Like like I think we all, like you and me, David, they were average Joes uh, out there doing it, having fun, but they've got a great perspective on keyboard playing. And we specifically, as you mentioned, we, we want to focus on well, what's the, what's their role in moderating a group of keyboard players, and what have they learned from that, and That's what right. perspectives have they seen? So, yeah, a, a really interesting chat, gentlemen. Great to have you here, and this is a bit of special moment, as you as we'll talk about in a little while. All four of us moderate a group, and this is the first time we've all been in the same virtual room. Yes, nice to meet you, everybody. Hello, everybody. Great to have you here. So, yeah, look, thanks, guys, for joining us. It is a real pleasure. And, um, you know, I thought we'd have a bit of fun having having a bit of chat about a, a range of stuff. So I thought we'd just start with some intros. Ken, we'll start with yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your um, history with music. Okay, well, I've been at it for a long time uh, since the, uh, well, I guess technically I've been playing a keyboard of some sort since the 60s. <clears throat> I uh, Started out as a, with piano lessons at the ripe old age of seven, thanks to my parents, and sort of did the the regular piano lesson thing for, for quite a while, for eight or ten years, as I remember. And um, somewhere in my teenage years, started getting interested in, in music uh, from the, the keyboard playing standpoint. There were two or three um, sort of things that I remember especially that, that really said, man, I want to do that. First, I had, had, had traded some equipment I had, some radio equipment I had for a guitar at one point because I thought I wanted to be a guitar player. That lasted about three weeks until I put my little cheap amplifier high up on my dresser, uh, played it as loud as I could while my parents were away. It shook itself off, fell on the floor, magnet came flying out. And that was the end of my guitar playing. So I said, plus I had these callous things on my fingers and said, the heck with this. I might as well play something I know how to play, so I, I went back to piano. Uh, not too long after that, there was a, I was at a very, very small private school in high school, and there was a couple kids, one played guitar and one drums, and they would get together during lunchtime uh, in our cafeteria, which was also our gymnasium, and <clears throat> just jam on a few songs. And I went up to them one time and I said, hey, I, I, can I do that with you guys? Can I? jam with you. I didn't have a keyboard at the time. I didn't <clears throat> know what to do, but there was also the little music room, which is also adjacent there. So I drug the upright piano out of it, mic'd it up with the, the microphone that came with one of these old record players. If you remember, the speakers were built into it and you had to unsnap it and the speakers came off. That was my amplification. And they gave me one song to learn. So the very first song I ever learned from a play in a band standpoint, and, and I was surprised that I was able to learn it and, and everything was China Grove by the Doobie Brothers. And so that was, that, well, it wasn't my choice. That's what they told me to learn. <laughs> and the funny thing is I, I, I still play that song now in my current band. And sometimes I tell that story to the audience if we're running, you know, if we need to fill some time, uh, 
from there, uh, in my last couple of years of high school, I got more serious with it. My parents, uh, one Christmas, bought me a little, um, it was one of these little home spinet organs that, you know, had the boom, chicka, boom, chicka, drums on it and everything. And, uh, but it, it was a Yamaha CSY1, I think. And it had a little built in monophonic synthesizer, a real synthesizer, very simple, very cheap, but uh, <clears throat> a real synthesizer that you could engage on the top keyboard. And um, so I started playing with that in my first band and with uh, it had some outs on it. So I plug into a guitar amp somewhere and started jamming around in my basement. And before long, I found myself in a, an actual real band. Um, I traded this pretty little organ that I could play home music on for an old Hammond M3, much to the chagrin of my parents because it was beat up and ugly and stuff, but man, that's what I wanted. And uh, and then went out playing for a couple of years, uh, in the last couple of years of high school with this band. Uh, the college years, got married too young, took me into uh, playing with some serious bands then with people much older than me, uh, but I really cut my teeth through it on the uh, early 80s, the mid 80s. Um, late 80s saw some major life changes that, sent me out west west usa of course i'm talking about and uh more bands out there did it full time for a little while i was heavily into what was the top 40 then in the 80s and played all that stuff uh i've owned a ton of keyboards um late 90s moved to uh, eastern u.s pennsylvania uh with a job, you know, unrelated to music, and uh, kind of got out of it for a while other than having a keyboard at home to plink around on. Somewhere in the late 2000s, I um, lost that job thanks to some complex buyouts from other companies and decided to, uh, and I'd already built a studio at that point in my time and produced at that point my own album, which you guys have heard a few things from. Uh, and... <clears throat> Uh, decided to buy a studio. So I actually bought a running commercial studio and ran it for about eight years before I decided I'd rather make money. Got a job and uh, got back into to IT, which is my my other big love in life. And uh, just got back into playing in bands again and uh, have enjoyed it ever since. That's great. And we'll definitely talk more about that too, Ken. So, and so you, you're based still in Eastern U.S.? Yes, in Pennsylvania, uh, which is a coastal state, or almost, it's got a little slice of New Jersey in between, and I realize we're a, um, a global group, so yeah, it's east, northeastern United States, we're right under New York, and uh, where I live is approximately an hour's drive north of Baltimore, for anybody that's familiar with Baltimore. There okay, you go, nice. And then, Walter, over to you, just a potted history of your, you know, upbringing and what got you into music and, and maybe start off with where you're based, most importantly. Yeah, I imagine that I should start with that in case that they want to pin out the accent. So I'm based in Guatemala City, Guatemala, Central America. So, yeah, it's a different kind of scene over here, mostly Latin music. Like Ken, I started about... When I was seven years old, my parents uh, is, gave me uh, lessons, you know, so, uh, it was the eighties. I, I sort of um, started with the lessons. In school, they had a really good music program. And so I developed a little sight reading over there and started clarinet. And in the, at the, also at the National Conservatory, I did a little piano and clarinet by then. I was already on my teens, so that's when I really took uh, took piano. You know, as a young man, that someone that actually cares about what they're getting teached. So uh, I took the classical music and also joined an academy that uh, gave me more contemporary stuff. I was really, really into it, and um, also was uh, doing the college thing. You know, I I am a uh, by trade. I'm a marketing guy and have a, how do you say, an MBA in business, did the nine to five thing. And about 10 years ago, I decided to go uh, solo with a music career. I was already a, a, a professional musician by then, which is odd because um, it was really hard doing the professional musician thing and having a nine to five job, you know, I, I don't know how, 
when, the things that you do when you're young, you know? I had rehearsal on Mondays, rehearsal on Thursdays. I slept on Wednesdays, played on Thursday, played on Friday, played on Saturday, sometimes played on Monday, on Sunday mornings and slept on, on Sundays and repeat the next week, repeat, repeat, repeat. I don't know how I didn't went crazy on, on that part of my life. And currently, I'm with a um, locally, I would say, famous band. I'm, I've been lucky to be with them for about the last uh, 15 years. And I'm, I am lucky to have played with the best musicians in my country during the last 10 years. So that's pretty much what I do. Well, that's, um, that's fantastic, Walter. Uh, and it's, uh, Tell us, are, are there any other projects you're involved in currently? So you've, you've got that. That, that band, obviously, that's been going for 15 years, is that the only project you have or do you have some other things on the go as well at the moment? Well, uh, I got my 80s cover band, which is actually the longest band I've been in. It's, uh, it's oh, I don't know. It's, I've been in that band for like 18 years. My, uh, my original music band, that's... Uh, let's see, I joined them in, in 12 4, you know, so time goes uh, by fast. Um, I've been lucky enough to work with the best female, somehow it has been female singers, with the best female singers in my country. I've been music uh, director for a lot of them, so mm -hmm. um, also some little other projects uh, from cover bands doing Latin music. Uh, music in Spanish, the, the, the whole thing, uh, doing merengue, cumbia, and stuff like that, which I'm not really good at, but I do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would think that, that that would be my background, but no, actually, I'm actually more of a rock pop uh, player. Okay. There's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of people that do the, the Latin music here that are really, really good. So I mm. tended not to specialize on that, you know, Latin music and uh, Latin jazz has, has had a, um, a big uprising lately. I, I, would think, I would say a lot of my friends have really gone uh, playing that way. Um, I get called a lot for tribute bands and the 80s stuff, I'm known for that. So I get called for when they need uh, a keyword is for that particular kind of music. So probably yeah, I'm, I'm in like four different bands right now. Yeah, busy. I Which, try to uh, keep busy. If, if you're a full-time professional musician, you want to be busy with that sort of thing. So that's, uh, that's, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, um, just networking your way through to, mm. with your friends. So yeah. that's how it works. Yeah, nice, nice. Uh, Ken, how about yourself? What, what projects or projects are you involved in currently? Just my weekend warrior band. That's yep. all. Um, and it's kind of mostly for fun and a little bit of pocket money is, is about really all it is at this point. I do have, you know, a full-time day job and uh, yeah. it's been pretty busy. And we're at the point now where we have grandkids that we'd like to see. And, and I just, uh, uh, I, I kind of did the full-time music thing via the studio and I, Sort of been there, done that, and I've got that out of my system. So, to me, at this point, I'm going back to my roots, which is just playing in the band for fun. And uh, we're doing mostly what's you know sort of the civic circuit over here, which are the yep. the clubs for American Legion and VFW vet, Veterans of Foreign War clubs, uh, the Moose clubs and Elk clubs and things like. I don't know if you guys have anything like that over there, but. Uh, they're just sort of the civic clubs and where all the old people my age hang out and drink and want to listen to a little bit of music. I just love uh, how I'm you like, said old, old people your age, Ken. I don't know that you're a lot older than us, but <laughs> what I was going to say before I ask the next question is there's one thing we all have in common from Walter, who I'm going, I'm assuming quite um, safely is the youngest of the four of us. And then the, the rest of us, we all have 80s in common in one way or the other. It's amazing as a decade just how musically it still dominates in so many areas. I yeah, think well, it, was a great, it was a great era for, for keyboard players, you know. Um, possibly playing live, one of my biggest influences is Nick Rhodes, which is, um, which uh, it's kind of weird because he's, Probably not known as a great player, but he's a great one-finger player. 
I heard that uh, that term in the forum, one finger player. His sounds are so iconic. The music keeps on going, keeps on going, and Duran Duran is, is still a major influence for uh, if you play in a ladies band. Yeah, Nick, Nick Rhodes is, and I, I assume all of us would agree that he's. I know he's a big influence on me, and and is certainly on our bucket list to get on the show if I can ever find a management contact to ask the question. Oh my god! Oh, my man would would yeah. blow if you got Nick Rhodes. So, but he is great, and just I mean Duran Duran is still great now. So, um, yeah. So mm-hmm. the eighties, but let's let's talk rigs then. So Ken, we'll start with you, just with your weekend warrior band and your one of three people on this podcast that only do weekend warrior stuff to, to a large extent. Um, what, what rig do you now use? Well, I have, um, I have cut down over the years from the very big rigs in this, the, the late seventies and eighties where I had a Hammond and a Rhodes and Clavinet and two or three synthesizers and everything on all sides of me. Um, and, and then over the years I've, gotten more i'm also a nerd i guess so i've always appreciated the technology and uh, i was doing heavy midi stuff even in the uh in the late 80s uh, and and so forth um and into the early 90s um at this point i'm all about light and easy to set up and highly flexible so my rig is a nord stage three compact which i use uh for piano organ electric piano and some synthesizer sounds because it does have a nice little synth with it. And then I have gone to a uh, Nectar um, T61, I guess it is, controller uh, with my laptop, which is loaded with Gig Performer uh, as my host. And then I, my primary VSTs are the Roland Cloud and Xenology stuff, which I just love the huge, huge library of stuff that is available there. Um, and that replaced my Phantom, so that was good that I was able to keep those same sounds. Uh, the Arturia uh, analog collection, I've got uh, the Swan saxophones, I've got uh, uh, NI horns, and, and there's several other things going on there. Uh, but between the two of them, and, and with the gig performer and the keyboards, I, I can make any sound known to man ever. So and it's light, <laughs> so that's good for me. Yeah, light is good. No, absolutely. And, and Walter, what, what, what's your go-to rig? Uh, I know you're in a few different things, but do you have some common pieces of gear that you always use? Um, I try to not use the same keyboard in more than two projects, you know, because you buy all the gear and you're like, well, it's just sitting at home uh, gathering dust. So um, usually when I, I do with my... Spanish related stuff. I use a, a Roland Juno, you know, it's not very complicated. It's more player based. Um, Roland has some big sounds in Latin music, so that works great. When I do the 80 stuff, I use a Korg M3 plus a Juno or maybe an, an old Alessis QS because it does have some D50 ish sounds that um, really work. And when I do my original band thing, I use an uh, Kurzweil PC3, 361. You know, just to make sure that nobody uses the same sounds. Kurzweil is not that popular here in my country. So when I take it out, because it's, it's kind of heavy for a 61 uh, keyboard, um, I like that. I like that. Oh, that's that's not a usual sound. I'm using also a, an Ultra Nova now with my original band music. Uh, I'm really liking it, the, being able to have that weird VA kind of sound with it. And yeah, um, cool. on big gigs, well, from when I do, sometimes I do jazz things. I'm not a good jazz player. I'm not a good jazz player, but I do that. And I take the you know, usual 88 note controller and get along with that. Not a big fan of the BS thing. Of the BST thing, but I do use them at my at my house. I haven't done the switch just yet. Yeah, cool, nice, nice. So we, we, we're very interested. Um, both of you gentlemen are very experienced and have done lots of gigs. And I'm, I'm going to start with you, Ken. Can, can you tell us what's the? Do you reckon the best gig you've ever done? 
And then we're really interested in the flip side. What's the worst gig you've ever done? It, it, it may be the same gig. Um, <laughs> I've, I've told the story on the board before, but one time in the, when was this? This would have been the early 90s, I guess, early to mid 90s. I lived in a town out west, the western United States, in Idaho, if you've ever heard of Idaho. It's famous for potatoes. Uh, called Idaho Falls. And it's a small town, about 50,000 people. And uh, the little downtown area there, they blocked off a, a large parking lot um, uh, up against uh, downtown buildings for a summer concert outdoor. They brought in Survivor, the uh, Eye of the Tiger people. And they had several other hits, and they were the big band. And they had hired uh, several of us local bands to be the opening acts. Um, so we were set up against a different stage, um, up against some buildings, and they had the big, huge stage um, kind of uh, 90 degrees from us up against some other buildings. Uh, there's a couple interesting stories here. First of all, it was a great gig because it was one of the largest crowds I've ever played to. We played fantastic. Everybody loved us, screaming, clapping, telling us how wonderful we are. We all love that, right? Uh, but the, the worst thing was while we were setting up, these were some old buildings we were up against, and uh, they were working with the main sound system over there for Survivor, and it got very loud, and it shook one of the very large glass pane windows out of the building <laughs> behind us. And it came crashing to the ground and I mean this literally, literally landing where I had been standing maybe 10 seconds before. Oh. It sounded like a bomb going off and made me jump 20 feet. And I turned around and went, oh my gosh. <laughs> Then later, the sound company was having a horrible time with the sound system for, for Survivor, and they just couldn't get it working. And, and even at one point, their stack of PA fell over uh, four <laughs> on one side. And, and a long story short, they ended up coming to us, because we were the last local band to play, saying they need to use your stage and your equipment. Wow. So here comes Survivor, and we're sitting there talking with our you know corresponding members in each of us in the band, showing them our gear and kind of how it worked a little bit and whatever. So they used our much smaller stage and our little PA system uh, for Survivor to perform the concert that day. So that was a very, very memorable and interesting game. I reckon it's not often you get the best and the worst in one. And uh, just the only thing is, Ken, I think you're a little bit selfish. If you had been standing in the right spot and been wiped out, it would have been the perfect headline of, um, you know, guy doesn't survive a survivor geek. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Were they um were they good blokes? Good were they nice fellas to talk to and yeah, that sort of thing? Were, obviously they were highly frustrated at the time because yeah. uh and you know how that is when maybe everything's going wrong technically for you. Mm. And, and uh, they were not thrilled about it. They they were nice enough. At the top it off, the poor guitar player couldn't guitar wouldn't work at one point and he threw oh, it down the gosh. stage, formed off and then the keyboard player and the other guys did one of their ballads and got through it okay, and the guitar player came back. But it ended up being a pretty good show, yeah. Yeah, nice, nice. Great story, great story. So, Walter, your turn, your your best gig and your worst gig. My best gig was uh, probably a personal one. For was very personal because I remember I was having a real hard time uh, at work. It was a very st stressful a month that I uh, I was already um, a manager, so I had a lot of things on my mind, and I had a gig um, in the interior of my country, not in the main city, but I had to travel. It, and I, I I left after work because I had to work on on Saturday, so I finished up work, drove like three hours to get to the to the venue, and. It all came crashing out, and we were um, not opening, but also uh, playing with the biggest band in Guatemala, the one of the oldest ones uh, called Alush Nawal. And it was a particularly good gig. People wanted to see us and the other band, and it all came crashing out. It was an awesome gig. Gig people screaming, you know. It was a great after party. 
and one of the best experiences I ever had playing. And the worst gig was probably an ongoing gig a few years ago uh, with a band that I did not want to play with anymore. So it wasn't one gig, but it was the gig. Um, you know, sometimes when you yeah. do this for a living, it, yeah. it, if you do it long enough, if you do anything long enough, even if you love it, it becomes work. Mm -hmm. By that moment, it had become uh, work for me. I did not mm -hmm. want to play with that particular singer anymore. So it was a, every gig was a torture. But mm -hmm. uh, things sorted themselves, themselves out, and I was able to get through it. So it's right. not. I think, I, I think there's an important point, isn't it? And probably something we can all relate to. If, if you really don't enjoy the company of the people you work with or if they make life difficult um what what could be a what could be an enjoyable experience can be ruined if if the, you're not yes. uh, playing with like-minded people i think or if they make the experience bad it's, it's like any workplace isn't it you don't like working with idiots <laughs> that's yes. right that's that's well put yeah no one likes working with idiots and so yeah, i mean and, and speaking of people that absolutely are an idiot so the four people on this call are most of the people we we help moderate in the the group that is keyboard players in cover band. So I just thought we might move on to that a bit. So, I mean, all of us joined as moderators in the last, I mean, Ken, you may have been there longer, but in the last handful of months, um, it's a group on Facebook that's got over 11,000 members. And we, we have the pleasure of, uh, as four of what, eight moderators, seven, seven or eight. Um, and we'll be we're catching up with um, Tammy and Paul and Rick and so on in, in another episode. How how have you found that? What what do you enjoy about you know getting involved with the group at that moderator level? For um, me, yeah, I was going to say Ken. I'll start with you. Yeah. Okay. For me, I don't know. I, it has really, even though I've been playing for a long time and have played hundreds and hundreds of gigs, and there's so much that I just was not aware of or at least not uh, acutely aware of that i've learned uh in this group and uh and that's been very eye-opening for me and um it makes makes it interesting it's always interesting when you learn new stuff right and um you know to, just to mention two of them real quickly uh and and this fits with with you guys with the present company i had even though i knew there were tribute bands I had no idea there were so many tribute bands out there and tributing so many different artists. I, you know, I'd heard of the Beatles and occasionally Pink Floyd and the ABBA, and I thought that was about it. <laughs> but there's just, uh, you know, many, many, many people on the site are doing tribute band stuff for many different artists they're paying tribute to. The other one, uh, and again, uh, present company has a bunch of this, I didn't realize there were so many keyboard players playing in multiple bands, subbing, doing that kind of thing. Because to me, my band was always like my football team or my softball team. You were on that team and that's what you did. And, you know, um, and it was just a strange idea to me. I, I knew that there were people who went out as hired guns and did things, but I did not realize it was so prevalent. Yeah, no, great points, Ken. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And and same for me. I don't know about you, Paul, as far as the the breadth of tribute bands and how many how many tribute bands there are for particular bands like Journey or, um, God forbid, I say Pink Floyd. And there are like there are a few tribute a few tribute bands around. Yeah, for sure. I, I think um, it's it's true what what you say, Ken. There, there's so many, and um, it just shows you how much people love the music. I think That's the right. nostalgia's nostalgia's a big big thing for people and these these bands are not accessible to everyone and so it's it's uh i think there's there's definitely a place for for tributes um if, if it's if it's done the right way do you know you're at the other point you made ken about the learning that's certainly what i've got out of it like the, just the things i've learned there's there's so many people with so much knowledge coming at it from so many different perspectives and and i always call this group a bit of a learning opportunity because there's just there's just different stuff you can pick up and uh it's yep. great so how about, how about yourself walter what, what sort of uh, enticed you to the group and also to wanting to be a moderator um it's really weird uh, let me see i think that i joined the group i joined the group fairly recently i joined it in february 
and it was a Facebook recommendation. I wasn't actively looking for a keyboard playing cover bands group, you know, so it just came up and oh my God, this, when I joined, I think it was like 3000 people. So in the last uh, three months, we had uh, 7,000 people join in. It's ridiculous. It, it was definitely an untapped market. I, I can imagine that uh, guitar player groups, there, there must be many of them, and most of them are probably a shark-infested cesspool. But we are very lucky. Our, our Facebook group is full of really good people. And that was possibly the, the most surprising thing, that there is not that um, everybody is looking to help everybody up like Ego is something that it's very much out of the question in, in our group. Um, we can see that we got some seasoned, really good people, really experienced players that are probably not very tech savvy or people that are very tech savvy that are not necessarily that um, traditionally good player, you know? Um, and a lot of people in between, people that just do this for the weekends, as lo also a lot of um, older vets, you know, that do this professionally. So um, you got to keep in mind that we have um, everything in between. So the knowledge is um, really gathering up fast there. Like there's a lot of best practices that um, I've learned about. You know, you get used to doing things your own way and you think that's the best way and the only way to do it until somebody comes up and oh this is how I do it and this is how I've done it for the last five years and you discover that that is actually more efficient and one of the things about being a keyboard player is that doing it live there is no manual for it it's very different than guitar play than guitar playing where there is so much little knickknacks and gadgets that you can use that are not necessarily available for a keyboard player you know like i um, like the like using a, a sub mixer that's a very much a keyboardist thing to do um or or share hatred for roland kcms that's also <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you know. You all hate it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you love yours. It, it makes a great practice amp, but um, if you do this long enough, you discover you will discover that that's not the most efficient or the best way to do it. I think they make great practice amps. Maybe take it to a rehearsal, but that's as far as as, yeah. as it will go. Yeah. Agreed. So, agreed. Agreed. Um, and so neither of you, I think both of you are very admirable saying that it's about the learning and Paul, you've said the same and I agree. It's about what you learn from each other as moderators. Then none of you are, are getting huge pleasure out of banning people. Well, we don't need to do that. Essentially. No. It doesn't, ha it doesn't happen very often. No, I mean, what I've noticed other than the obvious spammers, which we get our fair share of, um, <clears throat> Who, are, who have no interest in keyboard anything, but are there either just to promote something completely unrelated or maybe uh, uh, come in for their different philosophical or religious or trying to sell something things. Very few, you know, I think people have learned, uh, the group as a whole has sort of learned what we will and won't tolerate to some degree. Uh, we, we try not to be prudes, but we don't want a lot of bad language on here. Uh, we don't want a lot of contention and people fighting. Everybody has their opinions, as Walter was saying. And, and somewhere out there, there's somebody who loves those rolling nails. You know? That's right. Exactly. And, also, <laughs> and the, thing I love most, the thing I love most about the group, Ken and Walter and Paul, is I just love seeing everyone's offices when they're playing. It's just, it's just, it's just brilliant. Uh, yeah, yeah. For, those, for those that aren't members of the group and i'm sure this happens across the other members of the group that yeah everyone loves and i've done it i, I know i've done it um posting a, a photo of their rig at a gig and saying my office for the night and it's um yeah it's quite amusing how often that comes up and ken loves yes. it in particular we know ken particularly <laughs> enjoys it when people say that uh, yes and by the way that also translates to spanish you know people call it mi oficina Oh, there you go. Yeah, 
Yeah, you know? it's like they will post a picture on, on Facebook, my mi oficina de hoy, my office for today. And you know, looks like you have worked thing. you have worked through internationally, Ken. You've got to sort this out across oh, the that's globe. what I'm here for. That's <laughs> what I'm here for. If I tell somebody it's like trying to stop a river by putting my hand out, you know. You can't. <laughs> Oh, very good. But it's all it's all in fun, so uh, we, we yeah. enjoy that. That's the other thing. I think we have a lot of fun on here. There's quite a few humorous posts, or we make jokes. And at this point, you know, certainly among the moderators, but even among the, the general group membership, we've got inside jokes and things now. Like most of the group understands the office thing, for example, and will make jokes to each other about it when it ever comes up. And that's I, I find that good because it builds a sense of community when we, you know, sort of have common things like that that we all enjoy. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Ken. It's, it's got that really nice vibe about it. And the group itself, as you said, kind of knows what the standard is and, and that makes it very easy to moderate. Mm-hmm. On, a, on a very closely related subject, and we actually we get kicked off this this chat talking about this when we talked about how some a lot of keyboard players are happy to let the limelight uh, not fall on them, but fall on the, the rock stars out the front. Um, and I'll, I'll start with you, Ken, and then we'll get Walter's opinion on this. But do you feel that keyboard players are, and obviously I'm generalising heavily, but do you feel that keyboard players are maybe a little bit different to the other guys in the band, and, and how so? Yeah, well, first of all, I should say that I'm probably different than a lot of keyboard players because for most of the time I'm playing, I have been the carnival barker. I have been the one talking to the audience and, you know, uh, seeing tip the waitresses and, hey, now we're going to play this, blah, 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 and then telling stories and so forth. I'm trying to get our lead singer to do it more. She's a little shy about it, but she's getting better and better about it. Um, yeah, I mean, keyboard players in general, and again, this is generalizing, but I think it's largely true, tend to be more tech savvy, tend to be the nerds of the band a lot of times often are the ones who understand actually understand the way the PA works and or the lights work or or things like that and are called upon when when there's problems with those things and uh, many times I think end up being the musical directors of this so um, so my dog's decided to bark here so I'm not sure I can do a lot about that that's okay but but that's kind of you know I've been the MD for for most of my bands also and uh um, so yeah, I think we're looked at differently along that line. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with your points there. It's certainly, a lot of that's been my experience. What What are your thoughts, Walter? Um, my, I would say that um, one of the things that, that influenced that a lot, uh, like Ken said, is the musical director thing and the savviness. Most keyboard players usually have a classical music background. So that means that we actually know about music. We end up being the musical director. We end up having to take, you know, sort of the backseat to it because we have to yell at the rest of the band when something goes wrong. So you can you usually can't do that if you're in front of the people. And just the nature of, of uh, keyboard playing, you know, you have this big monolith of black things that sort of shield you from the audience. Like there's a line, my keyboard is my line. I am behind this line. People and the band all sometimes is beyond the line. So that's a psychological barrier that that I think that keyboard players impose to themselves. There's also the guitar thing. If you are into it, great. I, 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 I wanted to embrace it, but I haven't been able to, you know, go in front of the people, interact with them. So that's pretty much how I view it. You know, the keyboard is is a line, mm-hmm. at least for me. I like it. No, good, 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 good perspective. What, what do you think, David? What do you think on, on the subject? I think we are definitely a little bit different and I'm very much like Walter. I love nothing better. And I've said this so many times to people at gigs, uh, band members, they go, are you sure you're right up the back there? And I go, I'm never happier than if I'm at the back and and most ideally in a corner. If I can be in a corner with the, the keyboard across the corner and me just slithering in behind it, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> But I also don't do vocals. I can't sing to save my life. So it's easier for me to be up the back in a little bit unseen. 
Yeah, do you know, the, the one thing I, w- I would add to the discussion is I think if you're a, a reasonably competent keyboard player and you want to work in a band, you'll always find work because I, I, I believe people with the right skill set to, to play in, in bands from a keyboard perspective are, are a little bit rarer than, say, a guitarist or a bass player or a drummer. And so we, we can find ourselves fairly highly sought after if, if we want to be, if we want to be busy and that sort of thing. Um, it's one of the things I've really noticed. Exactly. Yeah. Can I add to that? Yeah. Mm, please. Um, you know, keyboard playing nowadays is not just about how good can you play. There's a part of it, but that's the, the, the base, the base level, you know, being proficient enough in whatever style of music that you can do. But what else can you do? What else can you bring to the band? Can you bring, you know, backing tracks? Can you bring samples? Can you can you also can you do harmonies? You know, um, I, there's a phrase that I I like to say in Spanish that uh, that goes like "musico que no canta no sirve," which translated to English would be a musician that can't sing, uh, can't really play. You know, like part of the um, process of how you can uh, articulate yourself playing is singing. If you can't sing a part, you probably can't really play it, you know? And the, the singing is so, such an added value for a keyboard player because it is much easier for us that we have the, um, the music uh, theory side of it to do harmonies. And if you don't know how to do harmonies, well, then you buy a little MIDI thing that will do harmonies for you. And that's also another thing in the tech side of, of, of keyboard playing. Can you figure how to, okay. So you have this artist coming to you. I need that this song sounds, I want this song, song to sound just like it does in my record. Can you make that happen? And you just play a little piano part, well, yeah, perhaps you are a great piano player, but that's not what the artist asks of you. Can you play it just like in the record? Maybe take your, you know, all your virtuosic playing uh, down a little and make sure that she hears exactly what she wants to hear, that those little sounds, those little nuances, uh, those little effects things are there for her because that's her cues, that's what they want to hear and that's what they're playing before. You know, keyboard playing is not just about... Um, Pushing keys is about the whole other thing that goes into production. Yep, I absolutely agree. Yeah, I agree. Creating soundscapes is a big part of the job, yeah. no, no question. And whether that's a B3 and a piano and a Rhodes or whether it's yeah. complex samples or, as you said, in some cases for some players, it's, it's managing backing tracks, um, that the soundscape is, is definitely a, a big, big part of the job. So I think that's a really good observation. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. You know, it's- though, just... Don't, don't, uh, yeah, you need to be able to do the piano, the roads, and the organ. That's, that's your basis. Can you do the samples? Can you do the background vocals? You know, that's, that's what is uh, probably required of you right now. Can you do those things? So if you can do those things, you will probably get a lot of work with uh, pop artists, which is um, basically how I make my living. I do a lot of work with pop bars, yeah. Yeah, no, great. And so let's let's get on to the the favourite question I know of of mine, and that's the worst on stage train wreck. So we've sort of come. I think Ken, your broken glass one is is great. But all right, Walter, we'll start with you. Worst train wreck on stage. I had a cork Triton Extreme blew up on me. Actually, I turned it off. I I was you know making sure everything was plugged in. Okay, so push the button and suddenly I, I saw a flash and smelled smoke right as I was starting the gig and I had a, a very big opening gig for a South American artist the next day and I was like oh my god what am I going to do now because well the gig that I was in I could do with uh, I, I like to bring two keyboards and I think two, two is the is the the perfect number of keyboards always have on stage. Um, So I managed that gig with the other keyboard, made a phone call and had to backline uh, another Triton and had to do a lot of, I played with a lot of backing tracks on that particular uh, project. 
So I had to import all the things. I didn't have all the expansions that I had on it, but I made it work in like four hours that I had, uh, you know, four solid hours that I could do it. So that was probably my worst. And and the keyboard, uh, my Triton Extreme, is was completely dead. It was like a lightning had hit it, and I had a power supply for it, you know. But the internal power uh, supply went nuts and took down every board. I know a little bit about electronics, so when I took it apart, it was an absolute train wreck. So I got this Triton Extreme that looks very good. It was very well gig but very loved. It wasn't beat up and it looks good, but not a single thing on it works. It, I, 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 it, it, sound, it sounds to me, Walter, like that's a roller damp has struck your Triton Extreme with lightning. I'd blame the amp. I think it's its fault. No, I had, uh, I had another keyboard on the same supply and the sound and, and they were good. Yeah, there you so, go. No, that's you know, a, good one. Just, a good one. Yeah. Oh, that's a great one, Walter. Thank you. And um, Ken? I remember a gig. This must have been right around 1990. <clears throat> um, I had a DX5. That was the big version of the DX7 at the time. Nice. And that was probably my main keyboard and uh, several other keyboards. And we were at a gig in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which is a very famous vacation place here near uh, Yellowstone Park and all those kind of things out here. But anyway, uh, during the middle of the gig, I had a soda, Coca-Cola, in a glass sitting on something. And I went to adjust something real quick and managed to knock the thing completely into the keypad of the DX5. And I, I couldn't have done a better job if I had sat there and poured it at. That's how bad it was. Immediately, the worst sounds... <laughs> Coming out through our huge PA and the monitors and my amp and everything, we quick as we could, we went and shut everything down. Now, this is right in the middle of a set and a song, remember? And uh, we just said, we're on break. <laughs> and fortunately, I had, and I don't know why, but in my case, I had a, a, a just bought and I had a bunch of cans of contact cleaner. And so we spent a very long break taking the thing apart as quick as we can, dumping out the liquid, trying to dry it up as best we could with napkins, and then spraying it with about eight cans of contact cleaner to try to get it clean. We got it working. It worked, but that keyboard was never the same again. Uh, the, the sliders were sticky. The keys were sticky and crunchy. And just that was probably the worst thing that ever happened to me in a gig. That is horrific. Absolutely horrific. I've, I've done similar to a computer laptop with, with a beer, but, but never with a keyboard while I've been gigging. Oh, my goodness. I'm amazed you got through it. That's impressive. Well, you know, and the problem was the Coca-Cola is all sugary. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just, oh, man. Nasty, nasty. All right, gentlemen, we, we're coming towards the end of our time together. It's been a lot of fun, but we have for you what we call the Quick Fire 10. So the idea of the quick fire 10, quick questions, quick answers. Uh, I'm going to start and uh, I'm going to ask the question of you, Ken, and then you, Walter. Here is the question. Stereo or mono? Stereo. Walter? Oh, me. Um, makes no difference. Okay. Thank you. Pretty good answers. Um, sitting or standing, Ken? Sitting, although I stood for most of my career, uh, I'm getting old. <laughs> Walter? Stand forever. Stand forever. Stand for it. I, love <laughs> it. I love it. Excellent. Next question. Keytars, are they sexy or are they horrible? I, I played one. I still have a Yamaha KX1 from way back. It's a heavy thing. I loved it back then, but for the same reason I don't stand, I don't do them anymore. You need to be cool enough to pull a key, uh, guitar. That's all I would say. I, I'm not cool enough, so I don't do it. <laughs> and I'm certainly not. Um, transpose button, Ken, or adjust on the fly? Uh, I, I use transpose on exactly one song, and it's only because... Uh, 
I had learned a particular song and played it for a long time in a particular key, and then my darn guitar player decided that he didn't like that. So only one. So generally, no. Well, when you play the same song with four different artists, you know, transpose is great. <laughs> nice. I, I like it. Um, so, oh, sorry, Paul, you go. Oh, that's all right. The next one is extend or no extend? I have gone column stand. I, I've used X stands, but I hate all stands, all of them. <laughs> Extends only for practicing, you know, for rehearsal. Cool. Uh, Ken, last gig you attended as an audience member. Oh, gosh. Huh, do you mean like big concert or just oh, like whatever? A big... and, and I think we'll have to lose this one, Paul, off the quick fire team because we've asked this of a bunch of guests and not one has been able to answer this. <laughs> Everyone's too busy gigging. No one's yeah. ever been to a gig. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. 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 Last thing I want to go see is somebody that's as bad as I am. So. <laughs> I, I I don't even remember. No, that's I, okay. I, I, Walter? Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, they I, look- yeah, I don't. I actually I don't take the fifth. I don't recall. But you know what? <laughs> one one of the things for me is that if I'm not playing, I really don't care because I when 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 I'm not playing. And I see somebody else playing. It doesn't matter if he's a friend. I'm, I'll be honest about it. I always think I can do better, a better job. Maybe it's an <laughs> ego thing, but but it's like my way of saying you should be you shouldn't be here watching somebody else. You should be out there working, playing. You should be out there playing. So that's probably and a a mind thing for the benefit. For the benefit of our uh, viewers and listeners here too, I'm just going to say something. Firstly, uh, I, uh, Walter is an excellent player, so I um, I can understand you. why you would feel that way. But but Ken, who just said, I don't want to see someone as bad as I am, well, that's garbage because Ken is also an excellent player. Yeah, yeah. So uh, both both these gentlemen yes. have got serious chops and very good skills and know how to serve a song. So we won't hear any more of that talk that's about right. uh, not being good fellas. Um, uh, right. The next question is uh, for you, Ken. What is the best thing about playing live music? Wow. I, I have always enjoyed um, the camaraderie of the band and the band members. Musicians are like a big fraternity, you know, and I've had non-musician friends and do, but there's something about musicians that we, we just have an understanding and a, a sort of bond that just doesn't go anywhere else. So I enjoy hanging around the guys, you know, and talking and chatting and going out to get something to eat or whatever, as much as I do playing sometimes. As far as the playing itself, you love it when the audience is getting into it and they're screaming and they're yelling and they're dancing and, and everything's great. So that, that, Keeps me doing it. Cool. Walter? Um, when people ride the wave with you. What I mean by that is, well, depends on the band, but um, when people are know the lyrics of your band, you know, your original uh, music band, and they sing with you, that's that's amazing. Also, when, uh, when let's say that you're in a, in a cover band also, um, when people stop doing whatever it is that they're doing and, they, and even the bartenders and the people from the place just turn back and stop whatever they're doing and they start to, to pay attention to the band and you can see it in their eyes that they're in it with you. You're in it with them. That's, that's what, I, what I love. Two different ways of uh, thinking about it. But, yeah, no, great but, yeah, answer. That's uh, what keeps me playing. Excellent answer. And then, Ken, the worst thing about live gigs? Oh, no question. The setup and the teardown. It's always it's been true since the beginning of time. Yep. No worries. Walter? You know, I used to think that the setup was exercise. You know, uh, when, when I go to the gym, I used to do the farmer's walk a lot. And I keep saying <laughs> that because... It, 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 it does the shoulders so that you can better handle your keyboard when, when setting up and tearing down. But as I've gotten older, uh, definitely the 
tearing down and doing stairs. That's the worst part of it. It's it's uh, it's funny you say that. I was carrying my two sixty one key keyboards through the airport the other day, and I thought, "Gee, this is the farmer's walk." I'm exactly what you just yeah, said. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and absolutely. and it's a gr- it's the best exercise ever for keyboard players, you know. Yeah, it is. Although I'd rather not have to do it. But yes, I agree with you. Um, uh, so, Ken, name one thing you would like to see invented that would make your life as a keyboard player easier. <laughs> Well, that's the kind of thing you got to give us a heads up on so that we think about it for a couple of days. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know that I have a specific thing, but I would sure like to see um, continued improvements in, in controllers with the computer thing so that uh, it can get smoother and easier and easier. In particular, I don't know why anybody doesn't seem to make a 76 key or 73 or 76 key semi-weighted controller with aftertouch and all the stuff on it. They, there's 61s, there's 88s, but I think there's 176 out there, but it's fully weighted or something, and, and I just can't find what I want in that, that way. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Walter? Oh, there's so many things, you know. <laughs> and, and, and being a marketing guy just makes it absolutely <laughs> worse. And, and having a little, a little like electronics background, Oh, it's just torture to see uh, uh, how many opportunities there are. But, you know, uh, the keyboard industry has their R&D, and I guess I don't know all the numbers, you know, um, like how much, how many people actually need this particular thing that would solve all my problems, but it doesn't exist. So um, that puts it into perspective. Um, two things that I would like to see is... Um, the first real software workstation, you know, like, yeah, we have things that put all substance together, but we still don't have a real software uh, workstation for keyboardists. Sure, you have a DAW, but it's not, not there yet. I think that what Roland is doing with the Roland Cloud, eventually we'll see something like that. And... The other thing would be the one platform that I think we're gearing up towards that. One platform for everything, you know, where you can use your substance and your effects and you don't have to worry about latency uh, issue, uh, latency issues, uh, compatibility issues, um, controller assignment. That's uh, an ongoing process, but I think uh, some will, we, will come up with uh, one for all solution on that aspect. I'm not sure what it's, how it's going to be, but I'm hoping that we'll see that within the next uh, 10 years probably. Yeah, and, I, and there are rumours that Roland are working on sort of incorporating the Xenology and workstation stuff into a Roland amp, so it's all there in just one nice thing for you. So that'll be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be good. <laughs> Um, oh my god we're, i think we're gonna make a lot of people with very not happy with my kc comments but right. you know there yeah but i said it yeah i said it i right. said you it i will by stand it. by it yeah, yeah, yeah stick, right. stick to it stick that's to right. it stick yeah fat, i'm gonna stick, stick to it but you know yeah. I, I i i sort of get it because for i remember when i was started that was the only thing you know, that was available. And that's that's the problem, the major problem with it. Some will, they don't know better. <laughs> that's right. You know, that's what they, I imagine that that's what they tell them to push at, yeah. uh, at the stores. Yeah, it's so true. it's understandable. And it's, and it, I don't hate them that much because they're perfectly serviceable when you're starting out and you're in your garage band, you know, and, and you need something to, compete with uh, the guitar player. I think they serve that purpose very well, but as you are developing, as you go into larger gigs, and you are looking, you know, something that will uh, do keyboards, the whole range, you start thinking, well, this isn't going to work anymore. That's right, no, great point. And then last question, red keyboards, yes or no? Ken, I think I know the answer. 
Red Kippur, do they make other kinds? Right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, truthfulness, I, I, I have had guys, for some reason, I kept up with every keyboard I ever owned, and I have it on a list. And it's over 60 keyboards now. Oh. And uh, <laughs> I've owned just about every brand, every type, from Hammonds and Rhodes through the big poly sense of the 80s to the digital stuff. Every brand, just about, and um, there's there's only a handful across the uh, you know years that have really kind of emotionally connected with me to where I felt like you know like a guitar player does with a particular guitar or something. You know, my Hammond, my Mini Moog, my Jupiter Eight back when uh, I had a Yamaha uh, motif that I just really really loved. And the, the last one on that list is my Nord Stage 3. I just really, really love that keyboard. So absolutely. No, absolutely. And Walter, yes or no, red keyboards? I think I've pissed off enough people for today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. So, so here's the thing, the, the red. Yes, but don't drink the Kool-Aid. There you go. Horses for courses. They they're good for pe- yeah, I agree. All right. No, yeah. Now thank thank you, gentlemen. Can't thank you enough. Um really great talking with you. And it's a pleasure also moderating the the Facebook group with you. Um and we're looking forward to continuing to do that. And um a huge um shout out to all of those that have watched this. It's just a little bit of an extra uh interview. We've had a great time doing and can't thank you all enough out there for taking the time. So we'll let these wonderful gentlemen go and we'll let you go and we'll see you soon. All right. Thank you so much.